Today, it's our huge pleasure to be speaking with Dr. Matthew Levering. Dr. Levering is the James N. and Mary D. Perry, Jr. Chair of Theology at Mundelein Seminary, and is the co-editor of the text that we're discussing today, Dogma and Ecumenism, Vatican II and Karl Barth's Ad Limina Apostolorum, available from the Catholic University of America Press in 2020. Dr. Levering, thank you so much for sharing this time with us. Oh, thank you for having me. Dr. Levering, uh, we understand that this uh, text represents a series of essays that were produced originally for a conference. The conference was titled Ad Limina Apostolorum, Vatican II and the Future of Catholic Protestant Ecumenism. It was co-sponsored by the Bart Center at Princeton Theological Seminary and the Pontifical Faculty of the Immaculate Conception of the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C. If you would, sir, what was the overarching aim of this ecumenical gathering? Well, the, it, the whole thing was inspired by my, my dear friends, um, Thomas Joseph White and Bruce McCormick. Now, now as you probably know, the dialogue between um, those two um, leading lights, they're uh, very influential, wonderful people, and the, the dialogue between them goes back some way. And, and so I think it'd be helpful to, to know that they have co-taught courses uh, with each other on Aquinas and uh, particularly on Thomas Aquinas and Karl Barth. And the, um, the beauty of it really is that their, their collaboration, uh, their friendship, even though they disagree, and <laughs> they disagree entirely on a lot of things, but they, they are both deep Christians and they, um, their collaboration has resulted in, in other books. I, I did bring one to, um, to the, my uh, work desk here, just to show the, the audience. It's called Thomas Aquinas and Karl Barth, an unofficial Catholic Protestant dialogue, and it's an, also an edited volume with many um, leading scholars. And but the whole thing began with this uh, this other book. It's called um, "The Analogy of Being: Invention of the Antichrist or the Wisdom of God." And so you can see they've been having a lot of fun together and and um, took co-taught courses, and they're they're the inspiration really. Um, and I think it's a beautiful thing. Uh, Dr. Levering, in what ways do you see that the ecumenism envisioned by the documents of Vatican II has been fulfilled in our current era? Well, I think that, remember, Catholics and Protestants had, certainly on the Catholic side, you would have had about 450 years um, where the main thing to do was to condemn each other. Certainly that's true on the Catholic side, that if you, if you read um, texts uh, written from the past 450 years, and and I've and I've done so. Um, you find a lot of um, there would be a, an apologetic emphasis on defeating um, various Protestant arguments. And um, unfortunately, the as it were, neither side ever per, seemed to persuade the other. <laughs> so they would fight like cats and dogs, condemn each other, and ignore the things that we share. And the condemnations um, would hurt, but they would continue on with this um, process, but it never got anywhere. Um, there was, and, and to me, it, it, there was a lack of Christian charity, really. Um, it's understandable. But uh, the Vatican II, I think, introduced a very important shift from the Catholic side. Of course, I think on the Protestant side, there'd already been some shifts. But and and also then among among young Catholic scholars um, leading up to Vatican II, Karl Barth was very um, influential, and he had a number of Catholic friends. And his um, there was a circle of Catholic thinkers who were eager to um, discuss and learn from uh, Protestant brethren. So there was a lot of beautiful things going on, and Vatican II um, brought that to um, fruition from the Catholic side in, in sort of an official way. Really grateful for that uh, very generous reply. Thank you for that reflection, Dr. Levering. Uh, it, in what ways has the vision, this ecumenical vision that Vatican II um, uh, showcases, in what way has that not been fulfilled in our current era? Well, uh, I, th I think it's been fulfilled. Um, the thing is that, um, you know, there, are, there will always continue to be disagreements uh, among Christians. You know, so so that any sort of um, expectations of um, some sort of regime in which Christians are going to stop disagreeing, you know, that that seems that seems like an eschatological uh, hope there. So, and then 
I, so in my view, in my view, though, it's um, the Vatican II vision has has been fulfilled. Other than other than for those who expected sort of a full unity. Dr. Levering, to what degree does Karl Barth perhaps serve as a point of convergence for Roman Catholic theologians and for Protestant theologians? Well, I think very much so because he is um in he was already in discussion with the with the leading Catholic theologians who emerge um, at the council. And these theologians, um, who are his friends, include um, Hans Urs von Balazar, but really ma many others, and a number of young, younger at that time, you know, his generation, his generation of Catholic thinkers. And so he was um, close friends. And, and of course, there's a couple of books <laughs> I brought. I, I did bring a couple more books to show. And one is called uh, Reforming Rome, Karl Barth and Vatican II. But the one that really deserves the attention is Dalkey's book. It's called Karl Barth, Catholic Renewal and Vatican II. These books are, are absolutely wonderful because they, they take you back to that time in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And you see these friendships emerging and these dialogues emerging between um, Karl Barth, Hans Richard Molzar, you know, but many, many other young theologians. And, and the key was that Barth saw them as moving beyond the neo-scholasticism, and Barth saw them as bringing the Bible back into the center stage for Catholic thinking. Dr. Levering, thank you so much for, for those book recommendations and that response. Dr. Levering, for, for uh, um, we Protestants trying to work with Barth, part of the conversation has become more complex in the last couple years, in as far as some studies have uncovered what some have already known, but these studies have made more clear and, and more a detailed account that Bart was involved in a long-term, essentially an affair with his one of his students for several decades. Mm -hmm. um, so many of us are trying to figure out what does this moral scandal mean for our appropriation of his theology? You're a seminary professor at a Roman Catholic seminary. What does Karl Barth's, uh, this relationship mean to you as a teacher of theology? Uh, of course, it's of course it's a shame, you know, and so on. So, in terms of, I mean, it's a sad thing. You know, on the other hand, um, we got to be careful here because uh, the Catholics are on no no ground to complain because, as you probably know, there have been revelations about the um, the Catholic. This goes back to the 19th century. There was a, a Catholic. Um, theologian, truly a wonderful theologian in, in certain ways. Um, his name was Joseph Kloiken. And Joseph Kloiken was a key drafter of um, the Second Vatican, or the First Vatican Council. So um, if you don't like the First Vatican Council, and Karl Barth did not like it, <laughs> then, uh, then you, uh, you can blame um, Kloiken. But the, the, point, the point of it is, though, that um, God has worked through simple hands. It's a, I mean, but it's still nothing to Nothing to um, treat cavalierly. You know, there is a real, there is a real tragedy, and and it's quite possible that there will be elements of Barth's theology, um, just like there's elements of, of any theology. But certainly, um, you know, I think there might be elements that have been affected, that have been affected by this. Um, I don't, I don't know, but I, I think that I think it's something to take seriously. But certainly not to, not to um, stop reading Karl Barth. Dr. Levering. In what ways has Karl Barth's theology of Scripture perhaps influenced Roman Catholic theology on, on the doctrine of Scripture? Uh, one thing what I noticed with Karl Barth on, on Scripture is that he keeps insisting that the church should not dominate or, or domineer over the Word of God. You know, that's, that's a crucial point for Karl Barth, you know, is that um, you got to always kind of watch that church before you know it, the church is going to be putting itself in the place of the Word of God. <laughs> And so you got to um, watch the church or be careful there. I think this is very valuable for Catholic thinking. You know, Bart challenges in his Ad Limina Apostolorum, he challenges the, um, his Catholic uh, friends, challenges them a number of, on a number of places, asking them, have they, have they really been hearing, have they heard the word of God on, on this point? You know, have they been attending to the word of God in scripture? And he, um, he presses them to... Um, to live up to to what they have always claimed, and of course, what Catholics have always claimed is that Catholic doctrine arises from Scripture. You know, that's that's the Catholic claim. Anyway, I I myself believe it, but the thing is that Bart really kind of puts the feet to the fire, 
And so very valuable, I think, for, for Catholics. And, and, and another point, of course, is that Bart has his way of kind of putting his finger on weak spots in the documents of the Second Vatican Council. And so therefore, he's, he's, he does that biblically, always biblically. He quotes scripture and, and puts his, his finger on some weak spots. And boy, has he, been, he was proven right, you know. Bart is remembered in uh, Protestant seminaries for the founder of this neo-Orthodox movement, and a lot of it does center on, or pivot on this doctrine of Scripture. Uh, the, the Word of God is within Scripture, but is not necessarily identifiable with Scripture in a one-to-one -one correlation. Uh, is, there, is there such a thing as neo-Orthodox theology in Catholic circles? What is the Roman Catholic appropriation or conversation vis-a-vis Bart's neo-orthodoxy. That's right. Well, th that was a widespread movement. The um, notion that, that divine revelation um, and the word of God are, are um, communicated in scripture, but that scripture itself should not be termed um, divine revelation. Um, scripture itself is not, is not the word of God, but it is, in a certain sense it is, because it, it communicates the word of God. And so God freely speaks through scripture. Bart's view on this is very um, influential, but it, it probably would have taken on anyway um, the Catholics, Catholics who hold this view. Certainly, certainly it's um, very present in the work of Joseph Ratzinger, um, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, but, but then also present in, in um, a number of other, the Nobel Theology or the Race for Small uh, theologians, uh, among which you would think um, Henri de Lubac or, or Hans Christian Wolzar. And, and so on. So it's, it's a very present notion. Um, now, the, the danger of the whole thing is that, um, is that scripture itself uh, really, you know, no longer, you, the worry is, the worry is that scripture itself will not be seen as, if scripture is not seen as divine revelation, but rather as the bearer of divine revelation, then the problem is, are people, are people eventually going to sort of move away from the word of scripture? Are they going to downplay or relativize scripture? That can be a concern. That's a concern that um, that actually Catholics share with with, with um, some of my evangelical friends. This is a this is something that's important. We need to be clear that that the words of Scripture, the propositions, the words, the actual words, are uh, are bear divine revelation and are and truth. You know, so we got to be we got to be kind of clear on that. <laughs> Good. I appreciate that. And I uh, freshly listened to the Roman Catholic Catechism in an audible format, something I could recommend to anybody who hasn't yet read the Catechism. And uh, if my memory serves me correctly, and I'm sure it does on this point, the Roman Catholic Catechism very straightforwardly affirms that the Scripture is revelation. It is the divine revelation of God. Do I have that correct, Dr. Levering? And then if I do, it seems to me that Roman Catholic theology clearly diverges from Bart on this point. Do I understand that correctly? Well, it, it is it is a little bit complex because um, Joseph Ratzinger on this point, I think, would, would not diverge from, from Karl Barth. You know, so there are influential theologians, um, you know, who would, who think, who, who would not, not diverge, but, you know, and of course, Roman Catholic theology is always a little bit of a, of a um, of a mess in the sense there's, there's always arguments in different schools, um, different schools of thought, um, all sorts of different arguments, and so on going on. So I'm not, I'm to my mind, the, the Roman Catholic position on this is, has not has not um, been fully stabilized. You know, I, I wouldn't, I don't see, I see this as a still a position um, open to debate, in, in part in part because you do have Roman Catholic theologians. And and um, they populate many many universities who who really do not see scripture. They're they're more within the kind of what you would the classical liberal tradition. They're they're more like liberationists or contextual uh, theologians. And so these these people see scripture as simply introducing a liberative model um, and so on. So, but I, the main point the main point though is that I certainly think that uh, the danger that um, Bart's position represents um, a sort of relativizing of scripture, um, the relativizing of the words, the actual words, the propositions, that, that needs to be, um, you know, there needs to be some care taken there. Really appreciate your responses there. Uh, Dr. Levering, if I can turn to Lewis Ayer's chapter in the anthology here, it's dedicated to the theology of uh, tradition. On what points 
concerning the theology of tradition, do Protestants and Catholics agree? And on, and on what points concerning a theology of tradition is there yet uh, um, serious disagreement? Well, one of, one of the interesting things about the, the 20th century, and especially the time in which Karl Barth lived, is that um, Catholics were, were trying to think through what, what tradition was. And so the great master is um, Yves Congar. And the basic idea was twofold. You know, on the one hand, tradition is, um, involves a certain content by, by which um, he, he means, he tends, he thinks of sort of monuments of tradition. So tradition would be um, things like uh, the liturgy, the form of the liturgy, or that would be the content. The content would be um, things like the form of the liturgy, you know, or the, or the collection of books, the collection of books that, um, that various uh, major churches had um, that eventually shaped the canon, that, that type of thing. So issues, in other words, like tradition would involve issues like, um, is the book of wisdom part of, part of the canon? <laughs> and that kind of thing. Now, or uh, there are other, other elements, but so tr that was the content of tradition. But, but they also talked about tradition as sort of a verb, as, as the church is handing on of what it had received from Jesus Christ our Lord. So, so tradition as a verb and tradition as, as sort of a, as a content and noun. But everyone was agreed, of course, that um, the tradition that there's, you know, of this generation in the 20th century, everyone was agreed that tradition is not a um, sort of a second source where you, if, if, you can't, if you can't find the dogma in scripture, you gotta, you gotta look over and, and maybe it was kind of handed on orally, <laughs> you know, that's, or handed on in some other way. Um, but so that there, there is um, in Catholic understanding of dogma, you know, there is a sense in which um, there's going to be dogmatic claims that that evangelical friends or Protestant friends are not going to find in Scripture. You know, they 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 kind of I say, the Catholics say, well, we think this is in Scripture, and the and the evangelical friends kind of look for it and and find that it's not in Scripture. <laughs> So there's a little bit of disagreement, and and in part it relates to the fact that Catholics, when when we say that a doctrine is in Scripture, you know, we can we can mean that it's in Scripture, but Scripture um, understanding the typology present in Scripture, or we can mean that it's in Scripture in some in some way that um, that uh, uh, some of our Protestant friends would would think this isn't quite right. Dr. Levering, thank you for that reply. Where do you see the real impasses to ecumenical progress today? Well, the impasses, uh, in part, it's in part you have a, a need for um, all all Christians, you know, to uh, re reassert what is proper to their own tradition. I mean, that's an important thing today because um, you know all all traditions of, of our faith are are sort of um, feeling vul very vulnerable to the culture and also having trouble handing on the faith to young people. So oftentimes, um, you know, what young people are attracted to and what they, what they really need is um, they need some firm, some firm lines, you know, and so you got to say, um, look, we're, we're, um, we're Catholic and you accentuate the, the, the differences um, you you don't um, you don't exaggerate them, but you you accentuate them, and you just say this is what it is. You know this is the truth, and um, that can be attractive to young people. And and the same thing can happen from the reformed side, or it can happen from from any side. Um, just this is the truth, and and the other people um, are just plain plain wrong. And so a certain a certain nuance can you know the remember of course the ecumenical movement depends upon um, a certain generosity and trying to treat people with charity and in the sense of um, seeing what, what, um, what in what they're saying can, can be under, understood from one's own perspective and, and um, can enrich one's own perspective and valued, <clears throat> you know, because, it, because it's true. I mean, there's, in other words, it's going to be truce. Catholics and Protestants really share quite a lot. And so there's going to be a lot of truths that can be shared. I, I resonate strongly with what you're saying. I'm also a teacher of students, and 
all of us, I would say, in our spiritual journeys, we need particular disciplines. We need particular approaches to yeah. Christian spirituality, whether it's Franciscan or, or whatever. We need particular mm -hmm. approaches to school ourselves in that. And then at times, too, uh, um, we can get myopic and can be self-destructive in our relationships. But those are tricky things to balance. So yeah, yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm very, very grateful for your response. Um, Dr. Levering, if I can close this interview with a question that we have been asking all of the interviewees on this program, and that is this, what would it mean for the church to be united today? How would we even recognize a united church? And what is it that we can do as Christians to pursue the unity for which Jesus prayed in John 17? What, what a wonderful question. I love, the, I love thinking about that. Now, um, I think that I believe, I believe in the ecumenism of friendship. I mean, really, that's that's what I believe in and, and try to devote a, a large part of my life to, you know, is is finding things that talking together about Christian mysteries and, and therefore building friendships. So sharing the fact that we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in him as the incarnate Lord, we believe in him as the redeemer, the savior. And so we might we might articulate um, aspects of this differently, but that's that's quite quite uh you know common it's it's not it of course it's not going it's it's not something that should surprise us um but we can rejoice together in thinking about our god the holy trinity you know we can rejoice together as friends and thinking about our lord jesus christ and and so on so friendships i think can can really be built and sustained but of course the friendships will have they have a certain pain in them in the fact that we are we are divided in certain ways but but i i can also um you know, you can be divided from friends, even even very close friends on the faculty. One is one is reformed and and one is um, Lutheran. They they might be divided also a little bit. So, I, I don't want to um, either exaggerate or minimize um, differences. My my main point is that I think that our best way forward is to continue to work on friendships as we talk about the things, especially talking about the things that we share that we love. And then also sometimes talking about things that we don't share and trying to understand each other, you know, where we're coming from. In the end, um, unity among Christians, I think, is is a gift of God that God that God will give. But I, I just I suspect it will not be till the end of till the end to the eschaton to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, because people people dis it's hard for people to not disagree with each other, and and it would be very difficult to reclaim a full unity. I don't I don't see that happening myself. It's been our wonderful pleasure to be speaking with Dr. Matthew Levering, James N. and Mary D. Perry Jr., Chair of Theology at Mundelein Seminary, also co-editor of the text that we've been discussing today, Dogma and Ecumenism, Vatican II, and Karl Barth's Ad Limina Apostolorum. Dr. Levering, thank you so much for your time and responses today. Oh, thank you. It's wonderful to be here.